Okay, I have here today a really interesting looking integral from the Berkeley integration B2020. We have the integral from one to two of this whole complicated thing, dx. Okay, before we get started with this, I had quite a few observations that I wanted to go over. So first of all, it's really interesting that we're really adding four things and yet they put parentheses on it. And I think the parentheses are kind of a hint as to how we wanna go about it. They're not just there for no reason. Okay, now point number two, now we're adding everything. We could just, try to split this into not four integrals, but we could maybe do this as three integrals with one of them being two. But again, the way they've written this, it makes me think that there's some kind of relationship between these two things. If not just this and this, then there's maybe a relationship including the one. Okay, my last point, if you just watch the video of the integration B, both contestants did this in like one second. They did it completely immediately. They had the answer like in their head, literally one second they were done and they put the answer on the board. So because they were able to do it in one second, it makes me think there's like a really good shortcut or something that we can use. Okay, so to get started with this, what I did was I wanted to find the relationship between these two things somehow. I took this whole chunk right here and I set this equal to y. So I wrote it as y equals one plus this whole thing. And then I just subtracted one on both sides. And what I did was I wanted to solve for x. And you might know where I'm going with this. I'm trying to see if these are possibly inverses, because if I solve for x and I get back this, then I will know that they're inverses. So then next step here, what I can do is square both sides. So we'll have y minus one squared is gonna be this thing over here. Then from here, I can take the reciprocal of both sides to bring this expression into the numerator. So we'll have one minus natural log over here. Then I can subtract the one on both sides again to cancel that. I can multiply by one to get rid of that and write this like this. And then I can use the property of logarithms to isolate my x minus one. So we end up with x minus one, and this is gonna be raised to e. So I can write this as e to the one minus one over y minus one squared. But then I can just add a one on both sides. That's gonna cancel. And now we've isolated our x. But then we can notice that what is this thing? Well, this is exactly this right here, just with the variable change from x to y. So that tells me that these two are inverses. And now that we see that these two functions are inverse of each other, I'm gonna rewrite the integral. Okay, now from here, I'm just calling this function over here f of x, and this over here is gonna be our f inverse of x. And then now at this point, what I wanna do is I wanna check these endpoints to get a feel for it. I'm gonna do a graph, but I wanna get these endpoints first. So if I look at first, let's look at f of two. When I plug a two in here, that's gonna give me natural log of one, which is zero. So this is gonna be over here, it's just gonna be one. We're gonna have one plus one, this value is gonna be two. And then when we look at f of one, well, we plug one in here, we have natural log of zero. So we're gonna need a limit. But when we look at the limit of this as x goes to zero, this part's gonna be minus infinity. Well, we have a minus sign in front of it, it's gonna be a positive infinity in the denominator. So this piece here is gonna to go to zero and we're just gonna be left with this one. And then you can do the exact same thing to evaluate the inverse, but I can tell you that for the inverse at two, that's also gonna be two and the inverse at one Again, we'll need a limit, but that's also gonna be one. And now that we established this over here, I just wanna take a look at a graph of these functions. Okay, now I have a rough graph of this thing over here to the right. And you notice for our graph, we're going from one to two because that's our bounds here. And it's important how we establish these endpoints, right? Now I don't really necessarily even know which one of these is my function, which one's the inverse. It doesn't really matter because we have this symmetry here you can tell my graph's a little bit off, but we do have this symmetry along this line. <laughs> because these are inverses and we have this symmetry along this line right here, this is gonna make it really easy to calculate. Now, of course, we know the area of this box right here, because this, is, this width right here is one and this height is one. So the, the area of this square is just one and we have two copies of it. So we're gonna have two from that right there. So what's happening in this region, I know I could probably use a better sketch, but anyway, we wanna add this lower area here to this area up to this curve right here. So like for my lower curve right here, I have this one, and then I'm adding to it this other chunk. Well, if you kind of think of it like a puzzle, if you took this and you swung it in here, these two, this area and this area is the same. So when you flip that, and if you, if you flip that and you put that right here, this is just this box. This just becomes this whole box right here of area one. And it's because these are inverses that these add up to one this way. So as it turns out, the area of this is just really easy to calculate because we have two copies of this lower box. So we have two, and then we have this upper box for one, and that equals three. 
And now the thing about this is this could actually be generalized. You could, instead of looking at this from one to two, we, by making our bounds more general and just going from A to B, then we could right here, we could have this also going from A to B. And to calculate this area, it's just gonna be this width here, but this width is just B minus A. So we'll have that. And then we want the area of the lower box and then the area of the whole thing. So it'd be like B minus A times A, and then plus it'd be B minus A times the upper height for, to get the larger box. We'd have B minus A times B here. Rearranging this, we could write it as B minus A times B plus A or B squared minus A squared. But you'll notice in the example, but you'll notice in the example we were given, this B minus A is just one. So basically in the actual exam, the way they got the answer in two seconds is they just took the upper bound B and the lower bound A, added them together and got three. And they did it in like two seconds. So I hope that made sense. And I hope my graph made some sense. So we'll stop it there. Thanks everyone for watching. Have a great day.